We all have questions about life after death, our eternal destiny. Questions like, is there a heaven? Am I good enough? Is there really a life after death? These questions can leave us wondering, but we don't have to live in fear. Discover why our eternity can shape today in eternity. 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 Anybody watched the World Series last night? Raise your hand if you watched the final game of the World Series. Wouldn't it have been amazing if the Phillies were able to come back and to beat the Houston Astros? And what if Bryce Harper, one of their best players, walks up to the plate and right before he took a swing, he pointed to center field and called his own shot and said, I'm going to hit a home run over the center field wall. According to legend, in 1932, it was uh, Babe Ruth who steps up to the plate. Whether this is true or not, we're really not sure. There is some very old footage that seems to suggest that he did just that. We're not sure what he meant. Some people say he pointed towards center field, and then in the fifth inning, with the score tied in the World Series, 4-4 to against the Chicago Cubs, Babe Ruth walks up, points to center field, and calls his own shot, hits a home run, and the crowd goes wild, and it's been in living legend ever since. And we'd say, man, that's pretty amazing. For someone to call their own shot, I mean, imagine if that would have happened last night, people would still be talking about it for years to come. We... <laughs> know someone who called their own shot, and his name is Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's the most amazing feat that's ever been accomplished on planet Earth. As we've been studying the book of John, we've been seeing over and over again Jesus foretelling the fact that he would die, and he said it over and over again, I'm going to come back to life on the third day. I'm going to die. And let me just go ahead and tell you, it's going to be sorrowful for you. He told his best friends. But he said, on the third day, I'm going to come back to life. And they didn't seem to get it. But here we have Jesus Christ calling his own shot. Now, if Jesus Christ can say, I'm going to die and predict his own death and then go beyond that and say, not only am I going to die, I just want you all to know, so after it happens, that you'll really know <laughs> that this is what I told you was going to happen. He calls his own shot and gets up out of that grave on the third day. Can we just praise Jesus? Because only God can do that. <laughs> only God can do that. And because Jesus Christ was able to call his own shot because Jesus Christ did this miraculous event that, by the way, a um, secular historian named Josephus chronicled this in his history of that era. He says, Jesus Christ rose again and his followers still exist to this day. He wrote it as historical fact. Here's the reason why. There were 500 eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 500 people saw Jesus alive again at the same time. This is a historical event. I could point you to this to help you believe today. The disciples, his best friends, gave their lives not for a myth or a fairy tale, some fable. They gave their lives because they saw Jesus alive again. So when they put the sword to their throat and said, we're going to give you one last chance to take it back and to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. They said, kill me if you want to, because I saw him alive again, and I know that if he resurrected from the dead, one day I can be with him in heaven forever, and I'm not going back. I'm not going to recant my faith. You see, you don't die for a hoax. I've said this often uh, in talking about these things, but 
the Apostle Peter would have said, hey, you know what? We made all that stuff up. We, we faked his death. It's the, greatest, uh, it's the greatest hoax in world history. But don't kill me because I'm just, we, we all made that up. You don't die for a hoax. We have martyrs that live in this world today. We call them martyrs because they die for something they've heard about, never experienced firsthand. We are talking about followers of Jesus who not, they did not hear about this resurrection from some outside source years before. They saw it firsthand. And so when they died, they died knowing what they had seen and they would never recant their faith. You say, why are you saying all this? Because of the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus died and he called his own shot and said, I'll rise again, and he did. Because of that event, whatever Jesus says, we should take seriously. Let me say that again. Whatever Jesus says, we should take seriously. And Jesus told us so much about eternity. We're in this series on eternity. And we've been saying this overarching theme of the entire series is this. What we believe about eternity should change the way we live today. That's the thought in eternity. And let me tell you, I just wanted you to know, we have a reliable source when we're speaking about eternity. We are sourcing, we are citing Jesus Christ. Now, today, we're going to talk about a place called hell. And today's big idea is this. What Jesus said about hell should change the way we live today. What Jesus said about hell should change the way we live today. Now, again, this is the words of Jesus Christ. I'm about to read scripture, and they're in red. If you have a red-letter Bible, these are the words of Jesus Christ about a place called hell. And Jesus has authority. He is a reliable source. After all, if he called his own shot, he can say whatever he wants. And we should take note because this is Jesus who is speaking this. I'm not going to give you my opinion about hell today, although I have one. And I'm going to go ahead and let you know my opinion is exactly what Jesus said. I started becoming a, a believer as a, as a boy. And normally in church... I was, a, I was a mischievous little kid, just to say that, right? Like, my dad was a pastor. I never went through those years where pastor's kids rebel and that sort of thing. I was just having fun most of the time, right? Like, not bad, just very uh, mischievous. Uh, he would be on the stage as pastor. My mom played the piano, so that'd leave me all by myself sometimes out there. And my cousin and I, we found ways to make church fun. We had these old slick pews. How many of you sat in pews growing up? Anybody? Yeah, a lot of you. And I would take these hymn books. Uh, you may not know what a hymn book is. It's a book with songs in it. And we used to sing out of it instead of on the screen because we didn't have screens back then when I was a little kid. And we would take the books, and I would sling it down the pew, and he would sling it right back to me. And you know? We were on the front row, and, and then I'd get lit up for it after church, right, because Dad saw the whole thing. And uh, I remember hiding under the pews. This was my favorite thing to do at church. I would hide under the pews right next to the aisle. And when ladies would walk by, I would grab their ankles. And <laughs> they would scream loud, man. I had so much fun at church. I really did. I had good experiences. One particular service, I wasn't hiding under the pews or slinging hymn books. I was on the front row, and God arrested my attention. The Holy Spirit of God began to talk to Myron. And I started listening as the pastor spoke about a place called hell. And I thought, wow, I should probably listen to what God's saying about this, you know. And I tuned in. And God spoke to my heart. And he called me. I'll never forget. Back in that day, we didn't uh, uh, say, hey, if you want to pray for salvation and say yes to Jesus, do it in your seat. They would ask you to come forward. How many of you remember that, right? So that's the way I grew up in old Baptist church. And that, that evening, at the end of the service... I had been sitting on the front row where I always did, and I walked forward. I knelt down as a boy. I believed what Jesus said. I put my faith in God, and he changed my life forever, for all eternity. That day, right? No, praise God. Yeah, praise God, man. This is the greatest day of my life. That day, God became my father, my heavenly father. And the Holy Spirit of God 
lives inside of me from that moment on. And this message about hell that God gives us got my attention as a kid. I'll be honest today, if there was one message that I would want to hear this side of eternity, this is the message. And today I'm excited to be able to, I'm not, I'm not afraid to talk to you about hell. I mean, think about it this way. Um, what if we're standing out next to Guadalupe Road? And I almost got ran over at Trunk or Treat. By the way, if you were out there, you saw we had an awesome turnout. Praise God. And I was out there. Let's, let's just say if I was on Guadalupe like I was this past Sunday night, and I saw you walking down the street, and a, and a garbage truck was heading down Guadalupe and was headed right for you, how much would I have to hate you not to say, hey, get out of the way, right? The garbage truck's going to smash you, flatten you like a pancake. Before you die, get out of the way. How much would I have to hate you just to say, oh, I'm not going to say anything? That would be bad, wouldn't it? But if I loved you enough, I, would, I wouldn't say, you know, oh, you know what? I don't want to startle them. Right? I, I'll just see what happens. I don't want to offend them and yell at them and, and tell them to get out of the way. I, but if I loved you. I would say, hey, uh, I want to warn you about this. And the truth is, Jesus Christ spoke more about this place called hell than he did about heaven, and for good reason. We're going to learn today that hell's a real place. Real people go there, and there's real pain in hell. So today, what Jesus said about hell was spoken so that he could warn you and the entire universe not to go to that place. He doesn't want anybody to go there. And so today, we're going to see what Jesus said said about hell and there's a particular passage that has always spoken to me and man this this message is coming from my heart today I would love for us to be able to see what Jesus said about hell so it could change the way we live today and make sure that as we leave today everyone is prepared for eternity Luke chapter 16 we'll begin reading in verse 19 I want to show you what Jesus says about this place. And he, and he tells a, a real life story about a couple individuals that die. One is a rich man, and, and one's a poor beggar guy named Lazarus. And we're going to read about these two guys and uh, their eternities, two very different eternities that were, that were spoken of by Jesus here. It says in verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple. Now, you could stop right there, and in the era that Jesus was speaking in, in Palestine, if a person was wearing purple clothes, they were filthy rich. We're talking Bill Gates. We're talking, like, very, very wealthy. It was, uh, it was you had the very poor who would never dream of being able to afford garments like this, and then you had the mega filthy rich like this guy. So he was very rich. He wore purple and fine linen and fine clothes, and, and he fared sumptuously every day. He ate like the best foods, and he lived in wealth and opulence. Verse 20, contrastingly, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. So he was at the gated community, Lazarus. He was not in the gated community. He was begging from the gate. For the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. There's a, a custom in that day that they would actually scrape off the crumbs. And then the dogs would normally get it. His pet hound or whatever he had. But instead Lazarus would beg for this type of food. That would be like the leftovers. Just even the crumbs. He's a very poor man. Verse 21. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So Lazarus had a rough life. <laughs> Extremely poor, hungry. Evidently, he was sick. He had sores. And the only friends that he had on this side of eternity were, were the dogs. Verse 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, this is a Jewish expression about paradise. Abraham's bosom would have been a very Jewish saying that they would relate to heaven. They would relate it to paradise, a safe 
haven, a spot where the angels carried Lazarus. This is a beautiful expression of what happens when we think about eternity for the believer. Angels escort believers into heaven. This is pretty amazing insight that Jesus gave us about heaven. Then it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into paradise, Abraham's bosom, heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. The, the Greek word's Hades. It refers to fire. And in hell, the rich man lift up his eyes, being in torments. And he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus there in his bosom, in this safe spot, this paradise called heaven. And we see these two guys, and they go into two different eternities. Lazarus, the, the poor man, into everlasting life. And then Jesus tells us about a specific guy who's very rich who died as an unbeliever. And he goes into everlasting death in a place that the Bible calls hell. And so today we see the truth about hell. What Jesus, the guy that called his own shot, a reliable source... Jesus Christ, what he says about hell. And there's so many misconceptions about that place today. I've, I've had friends that would tell me, you know, I'm not interested in your heaven. I'm going to go party with the boys in hell. How many of you have heard of those types of statements made? Like, we're just going to... Uh, we're going to go down there, and it's going to be the best party ever. We're going to ride our motorcycles, and we're going to get drunk, and it's going to be a big party. And that's a misconception. Now, there's a couple of uh, ways you can look at eternity and, and a couple different ways you can determine what you're going to believe today. You can, you can believe pop culture, and, and that would certainly fit into pop culture. You know what? We're going to go do our thing. We're going to party. And so today, you could choose uh, to believe pop culture's idea, concept about hell. You could also choose to go with your gut. That's what most people do. About 80% of people believe in heaven. About 45% of people in America believe in hell. Most people do not believe in hell. It pains them to think about it. And I get it. Who wants to believe in it, right? You could go with pop culture or you could go with your gut. And that's what a lot of people do. I just feel like. And this is your own opinion. So you, you, you are saying, I think I know, this is how I think it's going to go down. So pop culture, you can go with your gut. Or you could go with Jesus Christ, who called his own shot. And it's historically documented that he died and rose again, and he did these miracles. And he was a wonderful teacher, a helper of the poor, healed people that were suffering. He fed the hungry. You could, you could actually choose to believe what Jesus said about hell. And I would encourage you to do so. He said this, this is the first thing Jesus said about hell. He said, hell is a real place. And as we look closely at Luke 16, we see a real life story. Jesus is not teaching a parable. The text doesn't say it's a parable for one thing. There are no uh, similes or extended comparisons. There's not a metaphor here. It doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is like this or the place called hell is kind of like this place or as this. He says this is a story. One really th uh, important thing to point out is in this idea that it's a, a real place is look with me in verse 28. Verse 28 tells us it's a place. It's a place as real as where we're standing today, it's, uh, it's as real as Gilbert, Arizona. As Jesus uh, tells this story, and this particular statement is made by the rich man in hell. And he says, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest, unless they also come into this place. You see the word place there. This place of torment. And so we're... Listening to Jesus tell about this event, and he tells about a literal place called hell. Man, I'm telling you, this should grab all of our attentions. Jesus Christ, the same one that said, I'm going to raise up from the grave on the third day and come back to life. And we're still talking about it today as a historical fact. And he tells us about a real place. It should make all of us 
think. It should make all of us realize, oh, wow, how am I going to live today in light of what Jesus said about hell? And the big question, I think, for us is, why would Jesus even make a place called hell? Why would a good and loving God make a place called hell? Originally, it was designed for the devil and his angels. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. He makes it very clear. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was originally designed for the devil and his angels. You remember the story, perhaps, maybe you don't, but there was a revolt in heaven led by Satan who was an angel. And he took a third of the angels with him in this revolt. He wanted to be God. He said, I'm going to ascend unto the throne of the Most High. And God says, no, you're not. And he says, you're going to be cast out of heaven. And he cast out the other angels that became known as demons. And now the angel Lucifer, Satan, and his followers, fallen angels, had this place reserved for them. And you say, well, why would God, why would God allow all that? I believe with all my heart that God allowed Satan to do that with his fallen angels so that there would be temptations on earth to give us the opportunity as human beings to choose Jesus. Just like he put the tree in the Garden of Eden to give them a choice. God didn't create you as a robot. He could have done that and made us all just file into heaven one after one. But there's no relationship in a robotic, ritualistic type thing. So he gave us evil so that we could choose, I'm going to turn from evil to Jesus Christ because I love him. And he said, my master plan is to send my son Jesus to be the savior to save people from hell And they will have a choice, and I will have a relationship, a loving relationship with people so they can escape hell. They'll fall in love with me through my son Jesus, the Savior, and we're going to spend eternity in heaven. This is why. It was never designed originally for people to go there. It was for the devil and his angels. But it did bring about the opportunity for choice and for us to choose a relationship with God, and that's what God wants. Jesus said hell is a real place. Revelation chapter 20, verses 13 and 14 say this, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the second death uh, begins at the point of judgment. So if a person dies right now without Jesus Christ, without believing, not not a believer, okay, they reject Jesus, they don't believe in Jesus, they go to a place called hell uh, to be eternally separated from God. And then on judgment day for non-believers, which we talked about in week one called the great white throne judgment. Those verses in Revelation let us know that hell will be emptied after that judgment into a place that is an eternal lake of fire. It's basically the second death, the the second place of eternal separation from God. You've got, basically, let me just boil it down really quick. Hell won for those who die without Jesus, then they're judged and they go to hell too. It's really simple and people get it all complicated, but... That's the way uh, the Word of God teaches this, about this place called hell. Jesus said it's a real place. Jesus went on to say hell has real people. Hell has real people. I mentioned earlier that this is not a parable. This is a real story. One way we know this is because there are, is a name mentioned in this. And so... Jesus, in his other teachings, parables, doesn't assign names to people in those parables. Here is a real-life story, and he says, there's a guy named Lazarus. And he uses words like certain. Look in Luke chapter 16 with me, and we kind of see this. It says, there was a certain rich man. It goes on to say, and there was a certain beggar named 
Lazarus. And so here's, here's the horrifying thing about hell. Real people go to hell. This is not make-believe. It's not a fairy tale. I want to be really plain and simple with you. There's a real place called hell. Real people go there. And I, if real people go there, who is it in your life that you would like to share Christ with so that they could escape an eternity in this terrible place? Maybe it's yourself. I'll be honest with you. As a little boy, I heard about hell, and I loved Myron enough to say, okay, God, what's your plan for escape here? You love me that much that you died for me? Okay, I'm going to put my faith in you. I loved myself enough to give my life to God. And, and maybe that's you. Maybe you're hearing this and you're like, man, I need to make sure. I, need, I don't want to be a real person in hell. And then maybe you're like me today. And you're like, if I love my neighbor as myself like Jesus teaches us to, then I should love my neighbor enough to speak up and speak into their lives. If we love people and we realize that they could spend eternity separated from God in a terrible place called hell, then we want to rescue them. We want to help them escape. And I'd like to ask you, who, who are you working on? Who are you praying for? Who are you going after? Maybe it's your mom, your dad, a cousin, an aunt, a friend, a coworker, someone in your neighborhood. We should all have a burden because we as believers, those of us that are already believers, we love ourselves enough to escape that place. And if we love our neighbor as ourself, then we should love people enough to cross that little awkward boundary and say, hey, I just got to speak into your life because I, I care about you. Hell's a real place. Hell has real people, and, and last, hell has real pain. There's real pain in hell. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You wouldn't want me to be disingenuous with you. You wouldn't want me to be some compromiser. I believe this with all my heart. Really, this is one reason I'm in ministry. I don't want anybody to, to enter into eternity because hell has pain. Read with me in Luke chapter 16, verse 23. It says, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. This word torments in this passage is used four times. Some form of the word torment is used four times. And that breaks my heart. It makes me want to say, like, please don't go to this place. There's suffering in hell. Jesus doesn't want you to go there. He died on the cross so you can be 100% sure that you don't have to go to that place. There's pain from sensations. That is, there, there's pain from the fire on your skin. I mean, that, let's just be real. Hell is real. There's real fire in hell. You say, how, how can this be? It's just what it says. This is what Jesus said about hell. He said there's pain there. There's pain from sensation. There's pain from separation. And I think this is the worst part about hell, being eternally separated from a loving God and wishing that you had been with him. That's what death is. When we have a, a physical death, there's separation, there's your body and your spirit separates at physical death. Spiritual death is when you die without Jesus Christ not, not a believer, you die and you're eternally separated in hell from God. Pain from sensation and pain from separation. And notice the request here. There's a, there's a request from hell. And it's this rich guy. And he says, I've got five brothers. And he, he pleads, first of all, for mercy. He asks for one drop of water to be placed on his tongue. Wow. And notice the request in this story. The request is for one drop of water. And the reply is there's no mercy in hell. Now, thank God we have a season of mercy right now. 
God uh, is, has given us a dispensation of grace, an age of grace and forgiveness and mercy, and he is extending this time. You say, why hasn't Jesus Christ come back yet? Like we've, been, we've heard prophesied for thousands of years, it's because of the long-suffering patience of God who is saying, I'm going to give people as long as I possibly can to turn from their sins and turn to Jesus because I don't want anybody going to this terrible place. So the request from hell was for one drop of water. The reply was there's no mercy. No more mercy in hell. The Bible goes on to say in Luke chapter 16, verse 26. We'll read verse 26. It says, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix. This speaks of the separation we were teaching about. There's a separation a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us uh, that would come from there. So there's this separation, and the response is basically, no, this is the way it is. Remember the verse we shared week one says, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Once you depart into eternity, that's the way it's going to be for eternity. When we get this teaching from Jesus here. Now, there's no mercy in hell, but there is motivation in hell. And we see three motivating things from hell. Number one, we see that we should be motivated to pray. Hell motivates us to be praying. That's what the rich man finally did in hell. It says he prayed. Actually, he wasn't necessarily doing his daily prayer time. He was begging, same word, pray, beg. He was begging God that someone could go to his family so that they could be warned about this place called hell. He didn't want them to go. And so he's begging God in this story. He's begging God that someone somehow could go help them. Last week, we had a lady named Julie who had been prayed for by their loved ones for not 10 years, not 20 years. People have been praying for Julie for 30 years for her to come to Christ. And last Sunday morning, she gave her life to God after 30 years. Yeah, that's awesome. That's worth celebrating right there. And I see her. Praise God. Thank you so much for being back. And praise God for what he's doing in Julie's life. Who are you praying for? I'm going to tell you, God hears and answers prayer, and we should have someone on our hearts that we care about that we're praying for. Because if if you could experience the flames of hell like the rich man did, you'd be praying that somehow, someway, your loved ones wouldn't have to go to that place. Hell motivates us. It, It motivated me as a little kid to turn to God. I'm so glad. And you say, man, wow, that's kind of shallow. No, it's not shallow. It turned me to a God that loved me and embraced me and gave me new life and a purpose for living an eternity in heaven, man. I'm so thankful that I heard about it. And I want you to pray about someone who's not already ready for this place so that they could come to Christ. Hell motivates us to be praying. Hell motivates us to be proactive. Again, I'm going to ask you to contemplate who Jesus Christ would have you go to, to be proactively engaging, to cross that seemingly awkward boundary. You know what I found? I just want to share. I have found when I do cross that line and I say, you know what, I care about you. I, this is what I, I just want to share with you, that God loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. I'm concerned for where you're going to spend eternity. I'm not met with a fist in my face. I don't get cussed out. You know what? Even if they don't believe, they say, thank you for caring for me. And I think we have this idea, this concept that people are going to hate our guts if we show them love and compassion. If we show them the love of Jesus Christ and cross that boundary, that, that line that our world wants us to think, oh, man, don't do that. That's taboo, you know. Um, Separation of church and state, which is taken out of context. But they want you to believe that you have to be a quiet little Christian and that you can never share your faith. 
This man in hell lifts up his eyes and he says, wow, I don't want my family to go here. And he says, hey, uh, Abraham, can you send someone to my lost family members so that they can give their lives to God? He wanted someone to be proactive. Who can you proactively go after so that you can help them find a relationship with God in eternity in heaven? Who can you be praying for? Hell motivates us to proactively go after them. And then hell motivates us to be prepared. And I want you to be prepared. I want you to leave here today knowing that you're 100% sure that you have a relationship with God. And right now we're going to share a video of of Isaiah, our worship pastor. And he's going to share his story, how he made sure and made preparation for eternity in this video. It's a great video. I hope you'll... Take a listen. There was a point in my life at a young age when I didn't believe that there was a God. I remember growing up and thinking that I was just going to live forever and that there was so much time to be and to do whatever I wanted. At that time, I guess I didn't realize how far off I really was. To believe in an invisible being or a higher power seemed like a fantasy to me. It didn't seem real. As a child, I remember longing for something though. I had this hole in my heart that I always felt was missing. I don't know if it was from my childhood or what it was from, but I remember feeling so lonely and unloved that I needed to find a remedy, something that could heal my broken heart. I wish I could say that I looked in all the right places for that remedy, but unfortunately at 12 years old, I began to surround myself with the wrong people. I began to find temporary relief in drugs, attention, popularity, and so many other things. I was sick and I needed someone to help. My eighth grade year uh, was a year I'll never forget. I remember playing out at the school with my friends and what was supposed to be a normal day turned into a day that would change my life forever. One of the guys who I was hanging out with brought some drugs and they were laced with something I didn't know of at the time. And after a few minutes, I found myself in a desert alone and I was seeing things that were not normal. It was more than a trip or a high, but it was a dark and evil place. Uh, My friends were afraid that I was gonna rat on them, and so they actually left me there. Uh, But somehow, my grandma, she usually comes to pick me up after school, and she found me uh, and took me home, hoping that maybe a shower would get rid of what I was stuck in, uh, but nothing seemed to work. Later on, after a hospital visit, I would find out that I had the worst case of anxiety, and I just couldn't shake it. There wasn't, this this anxiety wasn't a worry type of anxiety or a nervous feeling of anxiousness, but a crippling weight that just put me at rock bottom. One of the hardest things in my life. Every day from that point on was more than I could handle. My mom shared with me a little, little while later that I would scream in my sleep and even in the car at points that I was possessed. In some cases, I, I even remember my vision. It would zoom in and out like a camera lens. And every day after that just felt like I was in the presence of something that wanted me gone. Growing up, my, gra- my, my grandmother was a Christian and uh, always told me that Jesus could help me. Jesus could take all this away and give me a new life, but I just wasn't sold. And one night before I was going to bed, I knew in my heart that I was probably going to take my life because uh, I couldn't live anymore. There was nothing to live for. The feeling and the weight I carried was way too much, and I just knew that I'd be better off dead. Um, but never in a million years did I think I was going to call on what I so strongly believed didn't exist. But I did. My grandmother's sweet voice began to talk in my head like a song melody that I just couldn't, I just couldn't shake. Jesus loves you. Jesus can heal you. And that same night, I got on my knees in desperation, and I prayed a prayer like this. I said, God, if you're real, this is the only shot I got left in making it through the night. I know I don't believe you're real, but I also wouldn't be asking you if I was fully in unbelief. My grandma says that you could heal me. And so would you do it? Would you give me a chance to live again? And if this prayer works, uh, God, I'll, I'll live for you forever. And in a moment, I felt this weight lifted off me. Peace filled my soul and I could breathe again. I knew in my heart from that day on, there was a hope and his name was Jesus. I wish I can say that life was perfect after that night. I didn't have any struggles, but the truth is I still struggled a little bit, but I had a new name. My name wasn't depression or anxiety, but it was beautifully broken. 
I realized something a little later that I'll never be perfect, but there's a savior that loves me enough that he'd be willing to die for me and fill me up with his goodness. And through my brokenness, it would leak out everywhere I went and people would know the true remedy to a broken heart. The only way to find restoration and that's through Jesus. Jesus saved me from hell and now I get to spend eternity with him. Praise God. That's powerful, isn't it? We love to hear stories. We love to see people tell their story because in our hearts, we all want to know that we have a story, a story that gives us confidence that, yes, I'm prepared. I don't know what your background is. Maybe you're like me. You grew up in church. Maybe you're like Isaiah, and that was... Not at all the way you were raised. Whatever your background is, there's a God in heaven who wants you to spend eternity in heaven with him. We've seen what Jesus said about hell. I just encourage you right now to make 100% sure that you are ready to go out into eternity. I love what God says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He says, the Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act. He's not delaying his second coming because he's unable. And he's not slow about his promise, as some men count slowness but is extraordinarily patient. How many of you would raise your hand today and say, I'm thankful that God is extraordinarily patient with me, thankful for second chances, third chances, for bringing us to this point even today where we have an opportunity to nail it down. God's been patient with us. He's extraordinarily patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish God doesn't want anybody to perish and go to hell. Let me, let me state this really plainly and clearly. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He's not willing that any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is what Jesus wants more than anything. He says, hey, listen, there is a hell, but what I really want is for you to turn from your old life, turn from your sin to a loving Savior who wants to give you everlasting life in heaven. I love what Romans 5, 8 says. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8 says, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You say, how bad does God want me to turn from my sin to a new life? I'll tell you how bad. Romans 5, 8 tells us he loved us even though we're sinners, even though we've all fallen short and messed up over and over again. He loves us so much. He demonstrated his love by dying for us on the cross. And that's the good news. We've we've heard the bad news. There's a place called hell. The good news is Jesus died so you would be able to live and to live for all eternity. It says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but, and here's the good news, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm so thankful that you don't have to pay your way into heaven. You don't have to work and earn your salvation. It's a gift. He wants to give eternal life to you. He wants you to have a home in heaven with him forever and ever. And then the greatest golden verse of the Bible, we call it John 3.16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the greatest thing I could ever share with you today is the fact that there is a good God in heaven who loves you so much that he died to give you everlasting life. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to live forever with him. And right now, 
I'd love for you to pray for someone. Maybe you would start praying even now in this moment. Maybe you'd like to grab a, a loved one by the hand and you could join together in praying for someone that's away from God. Would, would you right now join your heart up to God and allow this place called hell to motivate you to pray for them, to proactively pursue them, and to even cross that awkward boundary. And you're, right now you can think of them and pray for them. With a heart of gratitude to God right now, maybe you'd like to make 100% sure that you're prepared for eternity in heaven. And if you're not sure, if you're not 100% sure, I cannot think of a better opportunity in all the world than right now for you to whisper a prayer to God and nail it down and say, listen, I, I, I know what you've said about hell. I want to give my life to you. I want to start a relationship with you. God loves you today. If you feel him knocking at your heart, would you pray out to him from your heart? And I want to help you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And it's going to be really simple. And it's going to be something that you can just say in your own words right back to God. You can repeat him exactly if you want. But from your heart today, would you pray this along with me? With our heads bowed, eyes closed. Say, dear God, I'm ready. Please forgive me for my sin. God, save me from hell. I turn from my old ways. And I turn to you in my heart. I believe you died for me. Thank you. I want to live for you. Oh God, thank you for giving me eternal life. Help me to live for you from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, I'm... I'm thinking that today people in this building and maybe online have said yes to Jesus Christ. And if you did say yes to Jesus Christ, we've done something a little different today. The I said yes to Jesus cards are in the seats. We made them extremely accessible for you. And if, if you did pray that prayer, you say, man, before I wasn't sure, but I prayed that just to make sure. And, and I'm 100% sure. We're not asking you uh, for your information so we can bother you, you're not joining the church, you're not committing to giving anything, what we're asking you to do is just to fill this out because we want to encourage you, we want to be on your team, and so fill out the I said yes to Jesus card, if you will, and then um, I want everybody to take a minute, we've got time, we've got time for you to do this, just take out the pen, it's in the seat pocket there, there's an I said yes to Jesus card, if you prayed that prayer, if you've made sure today that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, we're so thankful. Can we all put our hands together and celebrate life change? Let's all stand together. Father in heaven, God, we thank you. We praise you that people have gone from death to life and made sure of their eternal salvation. In Jesus' name.